Now we're going to introduce the topic of electric potential. Um, and this is, so this gives the equation for the potential, for the potential energy between two charges. Um, and this is, so if you have two charges that have the same sign, this product is pro positive, so that the potential energy is positive. Um, if you have negative signs, the potential energy is negative because that is a more energetically favorable config configuration than if they are the same, si the same charge, the same sign. And you can think about uh, electrical energy as you could with mechanical potential energy. You can think about the, um, the potential as corresponding to a height along some, um, in some, uh, in 3D, so that if you are, uh, so if you are, for instance, on top of a hill, you have more potential energy than if you are at the bottom of the hill. Um, and so you can even draw the potential energy as, you know, a topographical map. And whenever you go, and things want to go down the hill, they want to go down in potential energy. Um, so here, if you have a bunch of positive charges here and a bunch of negative charges over here, um, and we already looked at what the electric field in this case was, if you have two infinitely charged, infinitely large charged planes, the, the electric field is um, pointing from the positive, the positive plane to the negative plane because a positive charge wants to go in this direction. You can draw that, you can think of that as like a slope, um, a slope as, as a function of the position in X, um, and the charge wants to move down the hill. Um, so here I can take, um, to be a little more precise, I can draw this as my X axis, and then I can draw, and we'll just put, we're not gonna use the Y coordinate, but I can draw a Y coordinate there, and then I can draw the, uh, the potential energy as a function of x, and that potential energy is going to be a straight line as a function of x. So that a positive charge, something wants to roll down the hill, a positive charge wants to move from higher x to lower x, moving down the potential. And so here we can calculate, um, we often want to, to, to talk about what happens to a test charge independent of what the, the charge is. But so, okay, we have a fixed charge here, lowercase q, we want to ask what happens to a test charge q. Um, and so we can write the, the potential energy for that charge. It is going to be k, lowercase q, uppercase q over r, um, r, yeah, over r, not r squared. Um, and then we can write this as things that do depend on what that test charge is and things that don't. So these terms do not depend on what that test charge is uh, in the parentheses, and this does. So we're going to separate this part out, the part that does not depend on the magnitude or sign of the test charge, and we are going to call this the electric potential, KQ over R. Um, and that will be useful. Um, that's useful because then, well, a few things. We can give the potential, and it doesn't matter what the um, distribution of charges is that leads to that. Um, or we can, um, uh, or we can, um, give the distribution of charges, and it doesn't matter what test particle we're putting in. So we're going to work through these different notions. We're also going to talk about how you calculate the total ener potential energy in a system. Okay, so here, um, if we have, just starting with energy and how we talk about the energy of these different charge configurations, we have it here a charge plus 5 um, nanocoulombs. And there is a, another charge here, plus three nanocoulombs. And these charges are 10 centimeters apart. Um, we can ask what the potential is over here as well. Um, so let's, uh, so here this is talking about the charge 
moving from 10 centimeters to 15 centimeters away. In this case, the potential is going to decrease. Um, we can write out what that energy is. We're going to use that K, our Coulomb constant, is roughly 9 times 10 to the 9. Uh, and then the units were Newtons per Coulomb squared. And then I have to have the, I, my equation is for the force is kq squared over r squared. So I need my meters squared on the top. Or I could look it up. Um, so I can either work it out or look it up. And physicists tend to hate memorizing, so we'd rather rederive everything than memorize it. So 9 times 10 to the 9th Newton meter squared per Coulomb squared. Now, Let's talk about the energy in each case. The energy is, the, let's, let me stick with U for the potential energy. U is KQQ over R. And so then in the first case, so we will do R equals, let's Start with R equals 10 centimeters, which is 0.1 meters. And then we have 9 times 10 to the 9 Newton meters squared per Coulomb squared times 5 times 10 to the negative 9th coulombs times 3 times 10 to the negative 9th coulombs divided by 0.1 meters. All right, so then we can make some cancellations. I have a 10 to the 9 here and a 10 to the negative 9 there. So those two cancel each other out. I have 9 times 5 is 45 times 3 is 135. And then, so I have 135. And then here, 10 to the negative 9 uh, times 10 to the 1. So I have times 10 to the negative 8. My units, my coulombs cancel out and one of my meters cancels out. So I am left with Newton meters, which is a joule, and I can write this as 1.35 times 10 to the negative eighth joules. And that's my potential energy. I can then write the potential. What is the electric potential there? Um, I'm gonna use the same numbers, except I don't have this capital Q. So I have K little Q over R, and this is 9 times 10 to the 9 Newton meters squared per Coulomb squared times 5 times 10 to the negative 9 Coulombs divided by 0.1 meters. These cancel out. And I have one of my coulombs cancels out and one of my meters cancels out. I am left with 9 times 5 is 45. And then times another factor of 10. So I'm left with 450. And then the units are Newton meters per coulomb. Um, and that, a Newton meter per coulomb, also happens to be a volt. So a joule per coulomb, 450, this unit is called the volt. And now we can do the same calculation for R equals 15 centimeters equals 
0.15 meters. And then what I'm going to do here, I'm going to be, instead of dividing by, I'm going to multiply, I can, instead of dividing by 0.1, I'm going to be, multi, be dividing by 0.15, which is the same thing. So this is... One point five times point one or three halves times point one. So here my U is two thirds times one. I'm going to write this as. Well, here I made a mistake. I didn't decrease that. So two thirds. Now this is 135 is 45 times three. So here I have 90. Uh, and this is joules. So I have 90 times 10 to the negative 8 joules, or 9 times 10 to the negative 7 joules. And then my potential, my electric potential is also going to be, it's going to be 450 volts times uh, 2 thirds. And then I can write 450 is 3 times 150. So that's 300 volts. OK, so when, first of all, the, the volts, the potential difference between these two um, values is much larger than the potential energy in, in terms of the size. This is a very tiny number of joules, a very large number of volts. Um, and that's because typically when we're talking about charges, we're dealing with very small charges. Um, nanocoulombs, it's a, 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 well, a nanocoulomb is a lot of charge, but it's a small number. So then um, when you compare the potential energy, then the potential energy is much lower. It, the potential energy is lower when the particle is over here, as we expect. Likewise, the voltages. Now, the nice part about a voltage in calculating a voltage is that the voltage is independent of what this test charge is. So I can go in and change my test charge, and I still my voltage is still valid. That actually lets me calculate because the potential um, and the potential energy for a charge is the value of the charge times the voltage times the electric potential. So if you have the electric potential everywhere, you can figure out what the potential energy is for a bunch of different charges in that potential. And that's why it's a useful notion. All right. And then when we talk about the, um, the work done, now the electrostatic force is always pointing directly between the two charges. So if you move in a direction, if you move, say, this charge in a direction where it is, um, where it is always moving perpendicular to the force, you are going to get no work done. Because remember, work is equal to the force, the dot product of the force with the displacement. So when you are moving perpendicular to the force, you will do no work. What that means when we're talking about potentials is that if you draw equipotential surfaces around here, now remember, I am a physicist, not an artist. So this is a rough equi, if that were a circle, let's pretend it is a circle, then that is an equipotential surface, meaning that everywhere I go, the potential energy is the same. And because the potential energy for a test charge is proportional to the voltage times that test charge. That also means that you have 
uh, your electrostatic potential is the same along these surfaces. So when you have the, if you draw equipotential surfaces around a point charge, they make concentric circles. Um, and if you talk about the amount of work done in different directions, so as long as you are moving perpendicular to the force, as long as you're moving around in a circle around a point charge, you are actually doing no work. And this is, you know, oftentimes in physics, we can ask things that look like deceptively simple questions. So uh, when you're, sometimes you can, and there's an impulse when you're learning how to do these problems to dive in and just calculate a lot of stuff. You feel like you're being more productive if you're calculating a lot of stuff. You would be well advised to slow down, think about the problem more, rather than put pen to paper. Five minutes thinking will save you three hours of calculations. All right, so here, uh, and here, uh, the electrostatic force is something that we call a conservative force. That means if you move in a closed path around here, you are going to, you will get no work. Now, you can think about that. The work done is the change in the energy. And when you're doing work with the electrostatic force, you're either decreasing, you're, you're either decreasing the potential or increasing the potential. Um, but you're not losing any of it to um, something like friction. If you think about your concentric spheres, your concentric circles, well, if in three dimensions, it would be concentric spheres of equipotential, then um, the only time that you're changing the amount of energy is if you go from one sphere to the next. Um, and if you end up, if the only thing that you have is electrostatic potential energy, if you go around a closed path, you end up at the same point you started with. If we go with our analogy that you're on a hill, you end up at the same height that you started at. Therefore, you have the same potential energy. Um, and therefore, because you're not losing energy to anything uh, like friction, you have a network of zero going around this path. All right, now we're going to do an example. We're going to calculate how much work is needed to assemble this charge configuration. And this is a little tricky. You want to avoid double counting. Um, so when the way that you we usually talk about doing this, you, you can do it in a couple different ways. But the way we do we talk about doing this is to count to add each charge one by one. So I'm going to label these charges, make life easier, make it easier for me to keep track. So we will call this charge one, this is charge two, this is charge three, and this is charge four. Okay. I'm going to first place charge one there. How much energy do I add? None, because I don't have um, any other particles. So just putting a charge there, I am left with no net potential energy. Two, I'm going to bring in charge two. Now I have the potential, and let me use U for the potential energy. Now I have the potential energy between one and two. So I am adding K, let me just do this symbolically, Q1, Q2 over, let's call this the, we're, we're going to call this the length of the square. And now I'm dividing by the length. And if well, we can do this both symbolically and we will put some numbers in. So we have 9 times 10 to the 9th Newton meters squared per coulomb squared divided by 10 to the negative 2 meters times 5 times 2 is 10 times 10 to the negative 18 
coulomb squared. So if I count my powers of 10 as 10 to the negative 9, plus 1 is 10 to the 10, minus 18 is 10 to the negative 8, plus 2 is 10 to the negative 6. So I have 9 times 10 to the negative 6 joules. All right. Now I'm going to add charge 3. And when I add charge 3, I have to, I have to consider the potential energy between charge 1 and charge 2, or charge 1 and charge 3, and between 2 and char charge 2 and charge 3. So U is K Q1, Q2, sorry, Q1, Q3 over L times the square root of 2 because now um, this is L times the square root of 2 plus K Q. 2q3 times L. All right, so then you see putting the numbers in here is a little trickier because of that square root. So this is where I'm going to stop plugging in real numbers. That's what computers are for. Computers can put in real numbers. All right, now charge 4. I'm, when I add charge 4, I have interactions between 4 and 1, 4 and 3, and 4 and 2. So, here, I'm just going to write my numbers, subscripts for each step. So here, when I add charge 4, I'm going to have K, Q1, Q4 over L plus K, Q2, Q4 over L times the square root of 2 plus K, Q3, Q4 over L. And then I can add this all together. And then I get my total potential is, I'm going to write it a big factor of K over L out in front, because every factor has a term of K over L. Q1, Q2, plus Q1, Q3, over the square root of 2, plus Q1, Q4, plus Q2, Q3, plus Q2, Q4, plus Q3, Q4. So now, what you see here is that I have six different terms. Oh, I'm missing here. I need a square root of two. So I'm missing, um, or I have six terms. I have one for each pair of charges. Um, so, and I have six different pairs of charges. So we actually can write this in general as the potential energy is K, Q, I, Q, J over the distance between I and J. And then we're going to have a double sum. Um, I equals 1 to N and j equals 1 to m, j, oh, and then here we want to specify j 
j is not equal to i. So we are not including, there's no term from its own energy because this term isn't even defined for that. Now, if we do this, note that we would have one term where i is 1 and j is 2, and we would have one term where i is 2 and j is 1. So that means that we are double counting. So the way that we can correct for that is put a factor of 1 half out in there. But the point of this example is to show you that you have to be careful so you're not double counting. When you add up all of these energies, you get all possible combinations. But if, you are, if you're doing this with a large number, if you're not careful, you can end up double counting. And that gives you a factor of 1 half out in the front. It's a good type of problem to ask on an exam to see if people got the concept, if they know that they ought not double count. It's very easy to double count. All right, and we could have done the same thing for the electrostatic potential. The answer would have been very similar. Um, you would have to talk about the, elect the potential at a certain point, however, um, because you'd need to know um, what the energy, you know, how far that point is from different things. All right, so, Ah, yes, and this is saying step two, do the work W to bring the, the three um, nanocoulomb charge from infinity. And we can actually talk about why that gets, um, why that is, why our equation for energy is what it is. We are going to define this to be our x-axis. We'll define this to be our y-axis. Th um, these slides do it in a slightly different order from I did it, how I did it, because I was, I'm not working from notes. I'm just making it up as I go along. Okay, so remember that work is equal to the dot product of the force with the displacement. And when we do this um, over, some, over a force which is changing, over that interval, we have to do an integral. Um, so if we're bringing in our charge from infinity, then dx is just x hat dx. Our force is equal to uh, kq. Uh, let's see, Q1, Q2 over R squared. And, ah, see, sorry, our dx, we're moving in this direction, so our dx is negative. Um, and because we're moving in the opposite direction of displacement, so work is equal to dx dot f, this gives us, oh, an f here I should say is x hat, so this gives us a negative, the k can go out in front, as can the q1 and the q2, because those do not depend on, oh, I'm sorry, this x should be r, this r squared should be x, because we're only moving along the x-axis, so we have k, q1, q2, times the integral dx over x squared, and we are moving it from negative infinity to, let's call it our final position, r. All right, so we still have our constants, and I dropped my negative sign there. We have a negative k q1 q2. The integral of 1 over x squared is negative x. And we take it, we limit from infinity to 
R. So we have K Q one Q two over R and then minus K Q one Q two over infinity is zero. So the work done to take the charge, the plus three coulomb charge from negative from infinity all the way here to a distance of R is K Q1 Q2 over R. And now to talk about what we do with to calculate the total energy to get that configuration, you move each of the charges in. We're not going to re this is that was basically a derivation of our energy equation. Um, so I'm not going to redo that. Then you can add another charge and another charge. Um, and that gives you the total, uh, the total energy to create that configuration of charges. All right. And I told you verbally about the electric potential. Now we're going to start using it. If you have an electric potential from a distribution of charges Q, then you can, um, you can calculate the electric potential with this. And that is a terrible choice of variables. This should say V, not E. Sorry about that. OK, so then a very useful, um, a very useful fact is that the, um, so we already showed that the electric field between two infinitely large plates is roughly consistent with being a constant electric field. Um, it turns out that the electric field is the gradient of the electric potential. Really cool. So I think I certainly can say that when I was an undergraduate taking introductory physics, I did not appreciate how awesome and cool this is. Um, there's a lot of stuff that I did not appreciate in my introductory physics class. It was not my instructor's fault. It was that you're seeing this for the first time, so you don't realize how useful it is later on. Um, it's easier to calculate the electric potential because it's a scalar quantity. And what this says is that as soon as you have the electric potential, you can always get the electric field. It's really easy to take a derivative but it can be really hard to take these 3D integrals over vectors where you're talking about you're doing dot products with the normal to a surface or whatever it is. Those integrals are really hard and they're really hard to set up. Taking derivatives is easy. So this is, this is a really cool and profound equation. And we can relate it to um, this analogy of electric potential and, uh, and the potential energy being like height, um, what, the, um, the, what the potential between two plates is, it's you know, the potential points from high potential to low potential. And this is telling you that you just have a hill with a straight slope. This equation that I, this graph that I put up here, we are putting, x here, and you just have a constantly decreasing potential. Um, you also can, so your, if this is your, um, if this is your electric field, the force that a charge experiences is the magnitude of the charge times the electric field. So, if I want to um, calculate, uh, for instance, the amount of work that I do um, going from taking a charge from here to here, I can calculate that amount of work done using the standard definition of the, of the amount of work done. So work is F dot delta X or in integral form, F 
dot dx here, we are going to let dx be negative x hat dx. So we are going to go from here, and I'm going to put my 0 here. So we're going to go from this point to this point, moving a positive charge from here to here. My force is now going to be Q, E, and the, the size of the electric field, and we're going to use the fact that E is all pointing in that direction. So Q times the magnitude of the electric field times x hat. Now we can take the, the dot product here, and the work is negative Q E dx, and we are going from x equals d to x equals 0. And this is the integral here gives us a factor of x, and we have 0 minus d, or a negative d, so q, d, e, is our total, and why did I, oh, I put a work, a student who did that on one of my exams would get in big trouble. Work is not a vector. When I'm teaching in person, I give my students candy if they catch me making a mistake. So, because I am prone to careless mistakes. All right, so our the work done is Q E, Q D E, and this is also equal to the potential energy. Um, that the change in potential energy. Um, and this also is going to equal the charge times the change in voltage. Or I guess the charge times the change in voltage. Um, because when we go from one voltage here to another voltage here, um, the total change in potential energy is the charge times the change in the voltage. So then I can use this result to calculate that the I can, I can calculate that the electric field, um, so here I use Q D E equals Q delta V, and there's a Q in both terms. The electric field is the change in potential divided by the separation between the two plates. A bunch of different ways that I could have derived that. This is a result that's very useful. It will come up over and over and over again. It's also, um, now this is only strictly speaking true when you have two electrically, uh, you have two electric plates, but that's not a terrible approximation of a lot of different physical situations. And a lot of physics, and I will admit, I did not appreciate this when I was in intro physics. A lot of physics is not actually calculating these cases. There's a, only a few types of problems that you can solve exactly. And a lot of physics is not solving those exactly. It is approximating things when you have a slightly different situation. Um, but that's not a bad approximation. So if you have to, if you have some funny equipotential surface, whatever it's doing, and you want to calculate the electric field, if you want a rough estimate, the electric field is always, let's go, let's say these are higher and these are lower, the electric field is always going to be roughly, um, the magnitude of the electric field is always going to be roughly the change in voltage divided by the distance between the two um, the two points. So here, I can approximate this as roughly constant. Okay, it's not really constant, but it's going to give me the right direction and the right sign, um, and that's going to tell, and the right, roughly the right order of magnitude. So even if you don't know the exact answer, 
Um, some problems, like some examples like this, like uh, two parallel plates, those are really useful because you can apply that in a case where it isn't valid, but it gives you the, it isn't perfectly valid, but it gives you the right idea, the right order of magnitude, the right direction. And then if you have to do detailed calculations, you can use those back, we call them back of the envelope calculations. You can use those to see if your mucky, ugly, more detailed answer is actually right. All right, and you know this is, so applications of uh, potential. We, when we talk about um, the energy stored in batteries and how much, um, how, how much energy they can provide to different electric uh, apparatuses, we use the potential um, because we're ultimately talking about moving charges around. Um, and you can generate potential. Here's a, in a figure of a Van de Graaff generator um, where you are measuring the potential between the ground. You define the ground to be at a, z at a zero potential. And then you are um, running a physical motor um, that has a flat, the, the, a physical motor that has a belt. And the belt is keeping, um, is getting some charges uh, off of the, um, it's getting charges to run off of the outer cylinder. Um, all right, and then, okay, so we can then talk about multiple different charges, and if you're talking about tr distances to a point P, then we use subscripts, and when we're, talk when we're using these ugly equations like I did when I talked about the energy for all, for as I'm moving all of those charges in, I'm going to put a subscript when I have different particles to help me keep track of particles. Oh. All right. And then we can talk about dipoles. Dipoles are really useful. A lot of times when you are uh, introduced to concepts in physics, it seems like, well, this is a very specific case. How often am I really going to come up with, come against problems where there's a positive charge and a negative charge that are ever so slightly separated? Well, actually all the time because in a lot of different configurations of charges, there is an, a charge imbalance. It's not all symmetric. So a lot of molecules and uh, a lot of molecules do have dipoles, and a lot of atoms and molecules that are not dipoles um, can be, when in equilibrium, can become dipoles when you put them in certain situations. So actually, dipoles are super duper common. Um, and here you see a diagram of a dipole. We can start talking about calculating different properties of that dipole. So you can calculate the, um, the potential here of, that you see in that dipole. Let's go ahead and calculate the potential, um, and the potential here and the potential right here. So we're going to call this point one. We're going to call this one point two. And we're going to go ahead and calculate the, um, the electric potential, not the potential energy, uh, but the electric potential uh, at the two different points. So our electric potential is KQ1, or sorry, KQ over R. Um, and if we consider point one, then we have to consider the potential due to, uh, we will call this charge A, and charge B. I don't want to use ones and twos because I already used ones and twos. So the potential from charge A is KQA over RA. The potential from charge B is KQB over R B and my total potential at point one is K Q A over R A plus Q K Q B over R B. I'm going to factor out the K. I can write this as nine times ten to the nine Newton meters squared per coulomb squared times um, I, I'm going to keep some of my 
orders of magnitude out here. Ah, let me start a new line so I can keep track of everything neatly. By the way, one of the things that you're learning in this class um, is how to formulate an answer. And that's one of the reasons why I like to actually work out all of these problems in front of you. It's not when, especially those of you who are being educated now, you've had a lot of computer-based homework where you are only tested on whether you get the right answer. That can be deceptive. Um, part of, one of your skills that you're developing is how to lay out an answer in a way that someone else can follow it so that you are writing a convincing argument. And this is somewhat analogous, I think, to writing an essay. Um, you, it's not just about reaching a certain point, but can you convince the other person of your point? It is an argument. So don't only pay attention to the science that I'm teaching you. Pay attention to the way that I'm laying things out and pay attention to my thought process as I'm telling you how to do these things because I'm showing you how you can convince other people that your answer is right as well. And this isn't an esoteric skill. This is what you use professionally when you are talking to people about about equations when you're when you're trying to convince people that some calculation that you've done is actually correct. All right. So, when I said move on to another line, a lot of times when I'm grading work, I wish people my students had just taken more space. Paper is cheap. Plant a tree when you graduate, but don't try to save the paper because you need it to make a good argument. And if I can't tell what you're telling me, I can't give you credit. All right, so we're gonna have this factor of K. We're gonna have nine times 10 to the ninth Newton meters squared per Coulomb squared. And I'm gonna leave myself a little space here. QA is three nanocoulombs. So I'm going to put 10 to the 9th coulombs there and the 3 there, divided by, now, uh, let's see, this is at negative 5 centimeters, and this one is at positive 1 centimeters. So I am 6 centimeters from charge A. Oh, wait a second. This point, this point is at 1 centimeter. So this one is at two centimeters, and this one is at negative two centimeters. And this is at five, negative five centimeters. So if this is at two centimeters, I have seven centimeters. And I'm going to make that, so seven times 10 to the negative one meters plus now my, I've pulled my K out here, so I'm only going to need QB is negative 3 nanocoulombs. I've already got the nanocoulombs out there. And then the distance between here and here is 3 centimeters. So here... I have, well, this is just negative 1, so I have 3 minus 7 over 7 equals negative 4 sevenths, and my potential is negative 4, oh, and then let me watch orders of magnitude here and the units. These guys cancel out, one of these cancels out, one of those cancels out, and I am left with joules per coulomb or volt, and I have nine times negative four divided by seven. So I have 36 divided by seven volts and 28 per square 
35 divided by 7 is, uh, is 5. So I have negative 5, and then 1 seventh is going to be about 0.2, uh, 0.15. All right, so that's the potential at 0.1. So now, if I have a dipole, this has zero net charge, but I still have a non-negligible difference in the, the non-negligible electric potential here. Um, I am more, now it's negative, because here I am more influenced by this charge than that charge. Now, if these two charges were exactly on top of each other, I would have zero electric potential because there's no, um, because the, this charge would effectively see, the, 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 a charge at this point would effectively see no charge. All right, we're gonna do charge two. I can use the same equation. That, that's really why physicists leave stuff in variable notation all the time. We do not like writing the same equation more than once. We put numbers in at the very end because a good physicist is a lazy physicist, which really means, I say that because you guys, you're gonna remember it, but what I really mean by it is do not work harder than you have to. The thing that you're often trying to economize in life is your own time. You're trying to do things in a way that saves you time especially now that we have computers. Make your computer read the ugly part. All right, so now I'm gonna, I can write that my potential is for point, and my potential at point two is still K, that's positive nine, nine times 10 to the positive nine newtons meters, Newton meters squared per coulomb squared. We're going to switch micro out. And then I'm still going to have nano coulombs and centimeters. And now for point, for this point, I am at, I'm three centimeters away from charge A. So I have three nanocoulombs divided by three centimeters. And I've taken care of the nanocoulombs there and the centimeters there. And then I have a minus three nanocoulombs. And then I have to figure out this distance here. Okay, so I have this triangle and this is three. Of course, this one was given so that it is a nice, neat number. So this distance here is the square root of three squared plus four squared. So it's nine plus 16, which is 25. So the square root of 25 is five. So here I have minus three fifths. All right, so this leaves me with negative two fifths. So I have negative two fifths. Ah, hang on. No, it leaves me with positive two fifths. The thought process that led me to catch that dumb mistake is that this is, um, so this is, I'm asking the potential energy of a positive charge and looking at the, the potential tells me the sign of the potential energy for a positive charge and the positive, the, uh, charge here is further away from that charge. So my net potential energy should be positive, so my net potential should be positive. So 5 fifths divided, or minus 3 fifths is positive 2 fifths times 9. Well, actually, yeah, times 9. And then here I am times 10. Um, so that's because, oh, you know what? Yeah, yes, okay, I did take that down. Okay, so here, 
these guys cancel out. And I don't know why I wrote a little M there. One of these cancels out, and one of these cancels out, and I am left with Newton meters per, per coulomb, which is what I want. I have 9 times 10. Now, this is 0.4 times, well, let me just, yeah, 0.4 times, no, this is easier, 18 divided by 5 is 3.6 times 10 is 36. So I have 36 volts here. So the fact that I'm here, so over here, it's negative 5.5 volts. Um, my potential is low, it's negative, because I am closer to the negative charge. Here, my potential is positive, because I'm closer to the positive charge. And I am being three centimeters away from the closest charge versus being uh, here. I guess I am also three centimeters away from the closest charge. But along this line, the positive charge is canceling out more of the potential from the negative charge than over here. Because here, your, um, your distance from this charge is just a little bit. So actually here, you're, with this one, your distance is further from the furthest charge. So you don't end up with as much of a potential. All right, so that's an example of how you plug the numbers in. Um, and then there's some estimates that you can make for the potential due to a dipole as well. Often when you are actually calculating real dipoles, the potential from real dipoles, you might not know, um, you, you don't care about the internal structure because you're far away. And it turns out that if you have a dipole, even if you're far away, that you still can have quite large potentials, even though there's net zero charge, the separation of the charge does give you a measurable, a pretty significant difference in the potential. Okay. So while I keep erasing that. All right, so this is a diagram for how we draw the dipole. Um, and we often talk about the dipole as being physically, the, the location of the dipole is at the midpoint between the two charges. And then we draw, uh, we are measuring the point P, um, the distance between that point P and the center of the two charges. That gives us uh, um, so that that gives us our direction. Now, if you think about either moving that point farther and farther away, or the dipole being coming closer and closer, if you have a teeny tiny dipole and you're far away, you're not very sensitive to the internal structure. So that's why we talk about it as being uh, we we put the center right there. And then you can give the potential, I will leave this as an exercise for the student, you can actually, that, that means it's a lot of ugly stupid algebra, the, you can approximate the potential of a dipole as K times the, um, the polarization vector um, times R hat, and then this polarization vector is the distance and then the pointing from the negative charge to the positive charge. All right, now we're going to do some sample problems. So we'll start with uh, integrating over a line charge. And what, so we're going to have a chart, a line of charge here. Um, this is somewhat analogous to what you would have from a wire, except that we are going to make it a very specific length. You're going to have it go from, it have a length L, so it goes from negative L over 2 to positive L over 2. And we're going to talk about the point, uh, the potential here. Um, and then I will modify the equations and show you how you would calculate the potential if you were uh, at some arbitrary offset. 
um, from, so this happens to be exactly at the midpoint, so there's some nice, so the stuff cancels out and it looks neater, but you could in fact do this for an arbitrary point x and y. Um, so our, our equation for potential is that the potential is k q over uh, r, and now we're going to integrate over a large amount of charge, so the Coulomb constant is the same, but now we're going to have a small chunk of charge Q and the distance from that charge R. And if we have a line charge, um, the, this will have a charge density of, we'll call it lambda, and that's just the total charge divided by the length L. Now we need our small chunk of charge Q. That is going to be lambda dy. I almost said dx, but then I had then I had to read my plot again. This is along the uh, this is along the y axis. So our small chunk of charge Q is lambda dy. Now, if we were integrating over an arbitrary point, it'd be the same. Uh, we're still going to, uh, the, the amount of charge would not change. We would still be integrating over the whole line. What would change is our distance r. So if we were talking an arbitrary point out here at, uh, let's call it x and y naught, then our distance r from the point we are at this point on the, the line to that point would be so x the square root of x squared plus y minus y naught quantity squared. And that would give you the distance for an arbitrary value of y naught. That's a little uglier to integrate. Um, not too bad. Uh, maybe we'll, we'll go ahead and give it, give it a shot. I'm, I'm winging it here, so forgive me if this, it will probably get ugly. Um, now, we are going to integrate from, so we're going to put this together, and our potential is the integral from integral lambda, which is a constant, so I can pull it out in front, dy x squared plus y squared, or x squared plus y minus y naught quantity squared, square root, from negative L over 2 to positive L over 2. All right. Then, Let's see, this one, to do this type of integral, you would have to do some type of trigonometric substitution so that, um, so that you could get this in terms of some trig function that you can, some sines and cosines that you could um, actually integrate. That's ugly, I'm gonna use an integral table. All right, so, our integral table. I'm going to change colors to make sure that we keep track of things correctly and move over here. So the table, the integral table lists 1 over x squared plus or minus a squared square root and it gives me the natural log of x plus x squared plus or minus a squared square root. And there's an absolute value around it. All right, now here the tricky part is this is in terms of, this has the variable x. That means we convert it to y's here. And then I am going to have to do a variable shift where I'm just shifting by uh, this value x naught 
And that would mean, and I'll call it x naught here when I write my general form. Each step is simple, but it's very easy to put, to have a dumb mistake in there somewhere. So I want to write it out carefully. All right, so now that's my general form. So I have lambda natural log of absolute value y minus y naught plus y minus y naught quantity squared plus or minus Y, uh, x, I'm going to have the x squared here, and then here I have a square root and an absolute value, and I am evaluating it from negative L over 2 to positive L over 2. And I can also use, I can use a fact here that the natural log of A minus the natural log of B is equal to the natural log of A over B. So this gives me lambda times the natural log of whew, L over 2 minus Y naught plus the square root of L over 2 minus Y naught plus or minus the quantity squared plus or minus X squared square root over then here I have negative L over 2 minus Y naught plus this mess. Let's see, now this is L over 2 plus Y naught, because my negative sign goes away. Ah, here I have only the plus sign, so I don't need, I shouldn't have written the, there should have been a plus. I don't need both signs. A giant absolute value out there. All right. And that's my big ugly mess. So what is the so what can we glean from this? Well, there's ugliness in some of these equations. Um, and let's see. The, now, you'll notice the book did the problem only for that point P. I did a slightly uglier problem. It wasn't that much uglier. If we were talking about calculating potential, calculating the, um, the electric field and integrating over a charge, it would be really, it would be uglier because you'd have to keep track of the electric field in each direction. Now, I've done the potential. If I want the electric field everywhere, I just have to take derivatives. I have to take the gradient, um, which is not that ugly. Taking derivatives is easier than integrating, and I have done one integral, and I have all of the information about the entire configuration. Voila, makes it easier. A good physicist is a lazy physicist. Do not work harder than you have to. Um, you'll also notice here that there's some symmetry in this, uh, in this answer because we're integrating over something that is symmetric about the x-axis. And that helps you check your answer. That's always a useful thing. We look at units. Um, let's see. I actually can tell I screwed up my units here. So I should have had k cubed over r. This should be a k. And then this is charge over length. So now I have this is this k times lambda 
has the correct units, which are the Coulomb constant times the charge divided by the length. Um, there, that unit, unit cross-check helped me prevent a, a dumb mistake. Um, all of this stuff is unitless. Everything in here, every single term has, length, has units of distance, but you're taking the ratio of two units of distance and it cancels out. So that's nice and lovely. Let's check limiting behavior. So as we get very, very, very far away from the, um, from the, the line charge, we should end up getting a zero potential. And that, uh, so if you get very far away, what you're doing is that you're making X super duper large. If you make X very large, then the Y terms end up negligible and you end up with the ratio of a large number, of, you end up with the ratio of X squared over X squared. That is equal to one. The natural log of one is zero. So as I go to infinity, I do in fact get the correct potential that I expect. I am seeing that the potential goes to zero. Yay! All right, then um, I can consider another case. Uh, let's see, we want the, um, so I should expect that as I get um, as I get far, the, as my distance becomes large, compared to the length of charge, this should start looking like a constant charge. That is, that if I'm far away, if x is large compared to, um, if x is large compared to the length of charge L, I should end up getting kq over r for the potential. It should look like a point charge. If x gets, so then I want to look at x becoming large but not quite negligible compared to the length. I don't approach having zero charge. Then um, this is going to be the, the differences in the signs here matter less and I end up getting something which looks like uh, which these in this square root you're going to be dominated by the x squared um, so then you're going to end up getting something which looks like a constant so then I approach something that looks like a, um, that looks like a point charge good those types of cross checks you'll notice that a couple of my cross checks led me to avoid dumb mistakes. This is a reason why. I would recommend that you try not, to, if you have, a, if you can, do your, on an exam, do the, all of the problems, and then go back and try to check yourself. Ask if your answer makes sense, because if your answer does not make sense, it is definitely the wrong answer. Here, I had the wrong units. I simply forgot a factor of k. Um, and when I looked at it for just a second, it was obvious why I had the wrong units. I would also say I encourage you to stick to the trick of uh, writing the um, answer symbolically until the very end. If you write the answer symbolically, it's a lot easier to catch stupid mistakes um, and to fix them without redoing all of your math. If you put numbers in, and most of you guys are inclined to put numbers in as soon as you possibly can, the problem with that approach is that if you have made a dumb mistake, you're going to have to recalculate everything when you find that, when you realize that you made a mistake. If you leave it symbolic, um, then you can go back and correct your answer, uh, and at most you have to only plug in the numbers at the very end. Another thing, often in physics classes, we really give more points for the work than for the answer. So, uh, <laughs> so even if you can't finish, get it started. So on a typical exam, I would give most of the points for setting up the integral properly. And if you make dumb mistakes after that, if you have set up the integral properly, you have shown me that you know the physics. So if you are pressed for time, <laughs> try to set up the integral at the very least. If you're pressed for time, Try to get down what you know, because then you're giving me something to give you partial credit on. All right, then we can move to um, calculating 
uh, more complicated charges. And this is the potential for more complicated charges. And this is actually somewhat analogous to um, what we did with electric fields. So here, um, if we look at a ring of charge, and now let's, um, we can use either, um, ah, this is, you can calculate the electric, actually this I will tweak, you can calculate the electric field from the electric potential or the electric potential from the electric field, hang on just a second. Okay, so now we're going to try to calculate the electric potential from this, and now we're going to use the same thing we did before, the, that the potential is the integral of some over some chunk of charge dQ divided by the distance from that charge. Now we have a ring of charge, so our dQ is going to be, uh, and we're only going to do it at this point zero, Z right above the axis. I will give myself a little bit of a break and not calculate the ugly arbitrary scenario. Um, all right, so a chunk of charge Q is going to be lambda R D theta because the distance of a small arc along here is R D theta. Lambda is going to be the total charge divided by the circumference. The distance R is capital R squared plus Z squared, square root. Um, if I were doing this at some arbitrary position, ooh, then it gets ugly because it depends on whether I'm here or there or there or way over here. This one is not so easy to set up for a general case as the previous one. So I am simply going to do the problem that the book does instead of doing more instead of doing a harder problem. Now um, I can write my potential as k. Now my chunk of charge is k lambda r is a constant, and actually my integral my r my z is also a constant. So all of this I can pull out in front, and then I have the integral over theta. Um, d theta from 0 to pi. And this gives me k lambda r over r square root times 2 pi. Now, I can actually put this in here and calculate that that gives me k q over r squared plus z squared square root. Okay. Then, um, then I can actually use this. So I can, I'm going to go ahead and also calculate the electric field. The electric field is the gradient of the potential. And um, now I can choose different. So I'm going to go at uh, exactly the origin. Um, and at the origin, um, let's see. So here, let's, I'm trying to figure out which version I want to use. Cartesian would be easiest to explain. And then I can use that, well, I only have the potential at, uh, okay, I only have the potential at this particular point. This gradient operator is the partial derivative with respect to x. There's an x hat there, plus y hat, the partial derivative with respect to y, plus z hat, the partial derivative with respect to z. Now, there is no dependence on x or y in this, um, in this potential. So 
these two derivatives are 0. And I only have to take the derivative with respect to z. Um, notice here, when we did this problem earlier, we used the fact that there is um, rotational symmetry to say you have to have a, uh, an electric potential only in the z direction. That falls out of this answer naturally. But it's also, it also provides a way that you can cross-check your result and see if that is actually um, a result that makes sense. Ah, and I forgot the negative sign. Um, and then I should have my negatives there. All right, so my derivative with respect to z then, partial, partial z of the potential is the derivative with respect to z of k cubed r squared plus z squared to the negative one half. And that is the k and the q are constant. And then I have negative one half r squared plus z squared to the negative 3 halves times 2z. And I get kq over r squared plus z squared to the 3 halves z, z hat, and there's an overall negative sign. So that tells me the further I am from the, um, the well, a couple things. The further I am from the, um, from the ring of charge, the, uh, the smaller the electric field, which is what I expect, um, if we consider the scenario where R is much larger, or sorry, Z is much larger than R, um, in that case, we can estimate, so for Z much, much larger than R, we can neglect the R term there, and the electric field becomes negative, um, Ah, let's see. Ah, yes, I had to have a positive there. Um, sorry, the, the reason that sign was wrong is because I have a negative there. Here I did the derivative, and I forgot the, the negative when I was plugging everything in. Okay, so for z much larger than r, I get k q z, and then this is just z squared to the 3 halves, or z, oh, and I have my z hat, this is z cubed, so this is k q over z squared z hat. So if I am far from the ring, it looks like a point charge. It should. Another thing that I can check to make sure that my answer is correct, if I am exactly in the center, the electric field from all of these points cancels out. I have to have zero electric field. Um, so if I am exactly at z equals zero, then I have zero electric field because I have that z there. Now, as soon as I go to negative z, I should get a flipped sign. The, so here, my electric field is positive if I have a positive ring of, or my electric potential is positive if I have a positive ring of charge, and I also have to have an electric field that points up in the z direction. And if I flip it over, I have to have a, I have to, so I have to also have a um, electric field negative in the negative direction, because if I flip the problem over, I have to get the same answer by symmetry. All right. So then you can see an example both of how it is, it is easier to calculate the potential of some complicated 
configuration of charge. It is often easier to calculate an ugly potential and then take the gradient than it is to do the ugly mess with electric fields. Also, um, when we were calculating, when we were approaching this problem by calculating electric fields, we had to use symmetry to knock out some of the integrals so that we didn't have to do integrals that were too gnarly and ugly. And the symmetry just fell out of the problem here. When we're using potential, it's a lot easier. So when you are trying to follow my advice and be a lazy physicist, you are often wise to look at calculating potentials rather than electric fields and use the potential calculation to calculate the electric field. All right. Then we can take the, um, so we had the answer before. Now we want to, we're going to use our answer from before, and we are going to use this to calculate the electric potential due to a disk. So our answer before was um, that the potential was K Q over capital R squared plus Z squared square root. And now we are going to integrate with, um, we are going to use potential equals, um, we're going to look at a small segment of potential. So we're going to say the potential from one little segment of charge is equal to K V Q over this mass. And we are going to write VQ now as the um, as 2 pi R. That's the circumference. VR is the width. And then we are going to have the amount of charge per unit area. Uh, we will call that sigma. And sigma is equal to the total charge divided by pi r squared. So now the potential, this is for a ring. Now our potential is the integral over a, the potential of a small, of a ring alone. And so we can write this as, I'm going to put everything in the integral at first, and then we're going to pull out the stuff that we can. D, or K, and then sigma 2 pi R D R over R squared plus Z squared square root. And then we can pull a bunch of constants out, and we are left with k sigma 2 pi in, on the outside, and then r d r r squared plus z squared square root. This one you can look up in an integral table. I find it easier to redo the to do the integral on uh, without an integral table than to look it up. So I'm going to use the u substitution u equals r squared plus z squared du equals two r dr or one half du equals r dr. Oh, and up here, when we were setting the limits, we have to integrate from 0 to uh, capital R. We are going to revisit the limits at the end. K sigma 2 pi. Now when we do our u substitution, this becomes 1 half du over well, u to the, let's see, the square root of u, so 
u to the negative one half du, and this is equal to u to the, I'm always going to increase the power by one, by one, so I have u to the positive one half, and here I have a factor of two, so that when I take the derivative, I get negative one half out in front, and I get a power of negative one half, and then I multiply by one half. So yes, there we go, and then I have my limits here, but I am going to plug back, plug this back in, so I have two pi sigma k, and then r squared plus z squared evaluated from zero to capital R. And this is going to give me two pi sigma k, and then capital R squared plus Z I drop the one half, R squared plus Z squared minus, and then here I have a Z. And it's an absolute value because I'm taking the square root of a square. All right, so that is my big ugly answer. You could also have figured out, you, you could also have done a little splotch of, um, of charge and integrated over two dimensions instead of integrating over the ring. Your choice. Um, when you're doing potentials, well, the, you would just simply have, if you'd done it over 2D, you would have ended up doing the integral over theta again, but there was no theta dependence, so it didn't end up so bad. Um, so I will leave it as an exercise for the student to demonstrate that if you do the integral both ways, that you're going to, in fact, get the same answer. All right, so now we're going to talk about field lines and equipotential surfaces and how you can what you, how you can understand a physical problem using these tools. So um, I've already introduced some of these concepts. When you have, so your field lines, oh, your electric field lines tell you um, where the, the electric field points. So here you can see the field lines for a point charge. And then you draw lines, you can draw lines for equipotential surfaces. So in equipotential surfaces, by, by convention, what we're going to do is that we're going to draw them so that the jump between each step is equal. So this, the change in potential between here and between the center and here is the same as the change in potential between here and here. Um, so then um, what you see for a point charge is that the equipotential lines are concentric circles and that they get further apart as you move, uh, as you move away from the charge. And the, all of the electric field lines point away from, the, away from the charge. We can then use, just as a rough guideline of how large the electric field is, we're going to use the electric field goes like, the, the magnitude of the electric field is something like the change in potential divided by the distance. So here, when the, electric, um, when the equipotential surfaces are closer together, you're dividing by a smaller number. Um, then when you, they are further apart. So here, your electric field is, is smaller than it is here. Um, and qualitatively, that now this is valid explicitly only for, uh, um, only for two plane charges, but it's a good estimate so that when we're drawing these, this gives us some idea if you were to draw um, field vectors and equipotential surfaces, how large you should draw each of those. Um, and again, think of this, if you think of this as like the, um, as 
like a topological map of something. Now, the electric field um, for a point charge is KQ over R squared. So if I plot the electric field, the magnitude of the electric field versus the distance, I have a steep, very steeply falling, um, very steeply falling electric field. It goes like one over R squared. Um, so if I am drawing the equipotential surfaces so that I have constant changes in, um, so I have constant changes in the electric field, um, in the electric potential, the electric potential goes like the electric field times the distance, then, um, let's see, this is changes in, uh, sorry, that is changes in, yeah. It should, so here, these equipotential um, surfaces are getting closer and closer together the closer I get to the, the charge itself. Now, a point charge is relatively easy. Um, if we look at more complicated configurations, now this is your dipole. Um, when you have a, when you have some net charge, uh, sorry, when you have a charge, a, a net, a charge is a source of field lines. So this is a positive charge. It, uh, a positive charge is a source of field lines. Posit the, the electric field lines go out from the um, positive charge. And then a negative charge attracts field lines. So you can see that the, the field from the positive charge goes to the negative charge. Um, and then the other thing is these field lines. So you can draw, rather than arrows, you draw field lines that shows you the, with arrows, that shows you the direction of the electric field. These arrows are a little bit hard to see on this figure, but they're always going to point from uh, the high potential to the low potential, so they're all right here like this. Um, the field lines are always perpendicular to the equipotential surfaces. You can think about this, again, as, um, as if you're having, you have some topological map. The field lines are going to show you where a ball would roll on that surface. And it's going to take the steepest path. It's going to ro roll down the steepest path that it can find. So if you're here, if you are at the positive charge, the steepest path it can find is to go straight towards the negative charge. Um, and if you start rolling down, if you start rolling this way, you're going to end up curling around and hit the, the positive charge that way. Um, and here you can see, again, the dipole, um, equipotential lines, um, where it's, it's zoomed out a little bit. Um, or sorry, this is not a dipole. This is two negative terminals. So here you have the same charge either way. So the field lines are emanating from, uh, or sorry, absorbing, because it's negative, the, the field lines are coming in and pointing towards the charges everywhere you go. And the fields are always, the field lines are always perpendicular to the equipotential surfaces. All right, this shows the, the 2D topological map that you would have. Now, of course, you have to, it really goes to infinity at the point charge, so you have to chop it off at some point to be able to visualize it. Um, but it's showing you where the ball would roll if you put it at any given surface, at any, any given point. And things are going to generally want to go to the very low potential from the very high potential. And this is just a cross section showing the same thing. Um, now, at some point, the lines get so dense you can't even really draw them. All right, now we're going to do a few different examples from out of the book. Um, we, uh, we actually, I think I'm going to skip this one because we actually did calculate the, we calculated the, the electric field from the electric potential due to a ring charge. We just did it in the problem where we did the um, electric potential. All right, two, the electric field lines and equipotential, this is, shows you the electric field lines and the equipotential lines for uh, two parallel plates. Now this is showing they're not quite parallel, which is why it's giving you a little bit less than a straight line out here. Um, so because the pot potential between two plates, is the electric field is constant, so the potential um, is constantly increasing. So when we drew potential versus x, where we put 
y here and x here, um, we had a constantly decreasing potential. Um, and that means that if we're drawing our equipotential lines, our equipotential lines have a constant change in the potential. For And then here you will see a constant, you know, if you make the change, uh, my drawing's not great, you make the change um, for a fixed change in voltage, you're giving roughly the same change in x. Your equipotential lines are roughly equally spaced. Um, the field lines are always perpendicular to the equipotential lines. And so here, the field lines are going to point from positive to negative, and they are always uh, perpendicular to those lines, showing you the direction that a positive charge would want to go in that potential. It's really useful to be aware of the parallel of, of the two parallel plates. It seems like it's arbitrary and esoteric at the time when you're introduced to it, but it has a gazillion applications and it's really useful to keep in mind um, when you are, uh, when you're looking at different physical problems. All right, this one is going to take us a lot of the remaining time. This is exercise 60. So a metallic sphere of radius 2 centimeters is charged with a charge that is spread out. So you're, you're given the different charges, and the problem is to calculate the, um, the potential everywhere. Okay. So, what we know, let me get to my cheat sheet. We're going to use here, let's see, everything is metallic. Um, so that means, let's see, as we look out here, the outer, let's see, the inner radius is two centimeters. And then it is surrounded by a larger spherical shell with inner radius, let's see. Ah, this one is solid metal. This guy's solid metal. So this tells us that the electric field in here, because it is metal, the electric field inside here is equal to zero. And then you have um, a gap, and you go from a five centimeter radius to a six centimeter radius, and then um, you have a charge. So this is positive five microcoulombs here and negative five microcoulombs there. And what we know is that the charge is going to all sit on the surface. And we know that inside the metal here also our electric field is zero. So we want to find out, find the electric field and the electric potential everywhere. Okay, now there is no net charge outside of the sphere. Um, so the electric charge for the electric potential from the, the electric field from the circle everywhere is zero uh, when we're outside of the circle. So let's see what we can do is here we know so all right, let us start. Our electric field is zero here. Our electric potential is going to be constant. So let us, so in the region, we're going to tally things up here for R less than two centimeters. The electric field is equal to zero, and the potential is going to be some constant. We'll figure out the constant when we get to that. Um, so for now, I'm going to leave it as V naught. 
then there is a positive charge. That positive charge has to be, um, has to all be at the surface. Now we're going to look at R is between two, ooh, that's illegible. So R is between two and five centimeters. And now we are going to um, use, the, so now the electric field is going to be K Q over R and uh, sorry, K Q over R squared, and then it's going to be R hat. It's going to be all perpendicular to the center. We are going to integrate from here to from five to uh, for, sorry, from two to five centimeters. So actually, the first thing we know is that because the electric field, let's see, the, so the electric field is this, and then we have to get, so we're gonna to integrate the electric field Potential is the integral of the electric field dot dr. And now we are going to put dr as r hat dr. And this is our electric field. So we are going to then get the integral of kq r hat r dr, or r hat dr over r squared. And then this gives us, and we're integrating from r1 to r2. This gives us a negative kq over R, a K, negative KQ, one over R. And then from R2 to R1. And R1 in this case is two centimeters, and this is five. Typically, you want to do, let's see, you want the potential to be zero. Sorry, you're, we're going to go in from, we're going to work this in the opposite direction. We're going to go in from the outside. So our potential, if we go in from the outside, our potential is zero outside because there's no net charge. Um, and... Yeah, that'll be an easier way to do it. So, R greater than six centimeters, the electric field is zero, the potential is zero. When we integrate from six to five, so the, poten the electric field is zero in here, the potential also is um, the potential is going to be the, the potential difference is going to be zero as well um, because we are um, we're not changing. So here, this is an electric field of zero. Therefore, you cannot change the potential at all. So then, um, when we are on our inner sphere, this actually would be also for five cent less than five centimeters because there's no electric field. Then 
then we get into the um, we get into the um, The end of the inner area, and then we are coming in from infinity. So let me double. So we still end up with the same integral. I'm going to tweak the limits. We are going from five centimeters to two centimeters. So I've got to switch these guys. All right, and when we get into, um, so when we are inside this region, so all the negative charge is here, and so the electric field from this negative charge is zero, but we're just inside, if we're just barely inside, we only see the um, we only see the positive charge. So then we have so R two is less than R one. So we have uh, ah, so R two. Let's see. Sorry, we're not always we're just integrating from five inward. And so if we are only integrating, ah, and my dr is actually, I have a negative sign here because my dr is in the opposite direction. We're integrating inward and then my integration limit is actually just r. So inside the sphere, is so from two to five centimeters, my potential is KQ one over R minus one over R one where R1 equals five centimeters. Then I, um, as soon as I reach the, um, uh, and my electric field here is the electric field from the one, from the positive charge, KQ over R. So then I get inside R less than two centimeters. I am inside of the sphere. Now my electric field is zero because I have a metal sphere. Um, and that means my potential doesn't change at all. So my potential has to be exactly what it was um, when I was on the when I reached this point, so my potential is KQ one over R two minus one over R one. R one is five centimeters. R two is two centimeters, and my electric field is zero. So the only place that I have an electric field is in the region between these two concentric spheres. Um, Everywhere else, so here, the electric field is zero because it's a metal. In the shell itself, the electric field is, is zero because it's a metal. Outside of the sphere, the electric sphere, the electric field is zero because I have a positive charge, which is exactly canceled by a negative charge. Um, so you will see problems like this where you are asked to figure out the potential inside of something. The easiest thing is if they are spheres. Uh, and the, there's a few tricks. You'll notice that I actually got tripped up on a few parts of this. 
Um, so remember, you want your potential to go to zero at infinity. It works best if you then integrate from negative from infinity on in. That is going to give you have to watch whether your dr is parallel or anti-parallel to the electric field. Your dr, if you're integrating from infinity, is going to be negative r hat, not positive r hat. Um, and then, um, and then as you reach each surface, then you have to uh, consider what's changing as you go into the surface. All right. So, and then the, the integrals themselves are not that hard. Remember that your electric field, so your electric field does not have to be continuous, but your, uh, but your potential has to be continuous. Your electric field, if you have a conductor, is going to be, um, is going to be discontinuous because the, conduct, the field goes to zero in the conductor. All right. Then we have the electric, um, the electric field on a wire. Uh, so you have, or a, you have some surface density. So you have some, like a positively charged wire, or, or here, met metallic pipe. So if it's solid metal, then your electric field inside has got to be zero. So that's at least part of it. And then, um, let's see, before, we, in the previous chapter, we had calculated that the electric field outside, um, the electric field outside was Sum was the diameter of the pipe sigma and then epsilon naught and then one over r r hat. And the question is what is the potential inside and out of the pipe? So now our electric field is radial and points out. So, um, and we are going to integrate from infinity in. Um, so our dr is going to be negative r hat dr. And then um, we are, our potential is the integral the negative integral of the electric field dotted with dr. So we get a sigma over epsilon naught, the negative sign, the integral of dr over r, and then um, from infinity to zero. Ah, this is the tricky part. Um, we actually are, we have to choose a zero potential at some other point. And this is, so we can't integrate from, so the integral without, let's come back to the limits. The integral here is just a natural log of r. So you have negative a sigma over epsilon not, not, not natural log of r. All right, now the problem is that we cannot choose r equals in, the potential to go to zero at r equals infinity because the natural log of zero is infinity. That does not make sense. And this, this actually comes about because it's really not physical to have an infinite line of charge. So uh, what we do, you know, you have a lot of problems where you can approximate it, but you have to choose some other point um, to set this potential equal to zero. So we choose that, we choose to integrate from R naught to R, and this gives us uh, A sigma over epsilon naught natural log of R, And 
negative natural log of r over r naught. So you have to watch that slight discontinuity. And then inside, so that's your potential as you go outside, then um, inside your electric field has to be zero, your field has to be constant. So this is the, the potential outside, the potential inside is whatever it is at that edge. So that's going to be negative A sigma epsilon naught natural log of A over R naught. All right. So when you have these, uh, you're given the electric field to get the potential, you can integrate all the way in. And then it becomes a bunch of math trying to solve this and make sure that you, in fact, have a continuous potential. All right, concentric conducting spheres carrying charges. This is almost identical. Um, so what is almost identical to the previous problem? What is the potential um, between the shells? So, ah, yeah, this is identical to the one we did a few back. So I'm not going to repeat myself there. All right, with that, we'll end this chapter. Thank you, and see you guys for the next one.